This session, which is called the Manage Your IT Pro Computer Using PowerShell. Uh, my name is uh, Jan Egelring. I work at uh, Crayon, a consulting and licensing company from uh, Norway. <coughs> I mainly work with the Microsoft infrastructure, where I have a strong focus on automation. So I work a lot with uh, PowerShell, and the last couple of years worked a lot with DSC since it came out, and SMA, and so on. Um, you may recognize my name if you're reading uh, things such as the PowerShell magazine, uh, the Crayon Services blog, which is my employer, and the Norwegian TechNet blog if you're from Norway. Uh, I'll also have some contact information at the end of the slide, where you'll find uh, my Twitter handle and uh, links to the slides and all of the code I will uh, show you. So, what we will uh, cover in this session. Um, we will look at how we can leverage PowerShell to configure our uh, IT Pro computer from scratch. Um, from basic things such as joining it to a domain, uh, configuring and installing software. Uh, and we also look at how to configure the local PowerShell environment. Um, thinking about things such as profiles and uh, environment specific uh, things. Uh, we also look at uh, at the uh, actions such as defining variables, importing modules, and such on, based on uh, what environment you're, uh, you're in. So for example, if you're in a customer environment, you might want to import some variables and customize the environment to, to that, uh, that uh, environment. Personally, I've used these techniques for several years, uh, synchronizing my basically my Windows PowerShell folder where I have my profile and so on across all the computers I work, uh, work at. So I have, for example, a virtual machine that I use for VPN connections because I don't like to have 10 different VPN uh, clients installed on my local machine. Um, so all of the places I work are basically sync in my uh, PowerShell repository. Um, previously, I've been using things such as uh, OneDrive or Dropbox to synchronize, but lately when I worked more and more with the uh, configuration management, or DSC to be specific. I've gotten a little bit more up to the source control, so now I'm trying to leverage Git a lot more. So that's what we're going to, to look at in this uh, session, to get the code from, uh, from uh, source control. <coughs> so in this scenario, we are starting with a completely blank, newly installed Windows 10 computer, which will go and configure to discrete our needs. Of course, I guess if I'm asking you in all in this room, I get if you're 50 people in here, I get I guess I will get 50 different answers about how you will configure your computer. So of course you will need to adjust. This is just uh, a starting point to give you some ideas of how you can can leverage PowerShell scripts and automation techniques to to suit your needs. So we will also leverage. Uh, different uh, features such as scheduled drops which was introduced in version 3, uh, desired state configuration in version 4 and also some of the latest and greatest in version 5 such as uh, package management and PowerShell GET which will also be available down level but uh, we are focusing on using the latest and greatest uh, for this time being which is Windows 10. And we will also do some tweaking of settings that is uh, specific to that operating system. Uh, some things are not automated in uh, what I'm going to show you. For example, things like setting up accounts in Outlook, uh, credentials in OneDrive, and, and so on. It's po probably possible to do it, but uh, in this uh, setting, I guess it would not uh, be worth the effort compared to the, the number of times it will be used. So I'm basically going to install software, but uh, not so much configuring accounts and stuff like that. One thing I wanted to do was to pin programs to the taskbar. That's something that uh, I created a module for in the Windows 7 timeframe, which did work initially in Windows 10, but after the second or third cumulative update, it doesn't work anymore. So I'll have some more information about that in the demo. So then it's mostly <coughs> just demos for the rest of it. Let's just duplicate. Uh, for this demo, I'm going to use two computers. The first one is uh, completely blank with uh, Windows 10 installed. 
for the second one, it's uh, fully configured, so uh, I didn't have time to wait for software installations and so on, so the second one have everything uh, configured. So now we're at the starting point, we just installed Windows 10 and nothing is customized. So we have to get the initial uh, scripts and configurations from somewhere, so I'm just going to get it from source control. So here is a git repository which is stored in our internal uh, GitLab server at Crayon, but I also pushed this to GitHub and uh, will uh, distribute the URL later today. So here I created this initialized repository script, which I will basically just copy over to the PowerShell IC on the computer. I'm just going to copy this. <coughs> Uh, this is a <coughs> Windows 10 default installation with a few customizations. We have a local user which have admin privileges so I can do customizations. All Windows updates are available until uh, September is installed. I'm also using an internal package management uh, source so which is having a, a local or private root CA certificate which I have installed. I also chose to pre-install the Git client so we don't have to sit and wait for it to, to install even though it, it's pretty fast but I chose to just uh, pre-install it. I also had some issues uh, when I initially tried to configure this demo environment when I was going to leverage package management and uh, PowerShell get to install software on PowerShell modules. Uh, specifically, there was a problem with package management on the chocolate provider, which uh, made it seem like it was installing software, but actually nothing was uh, installed. But uh, in later versions, this seems to be solved. So on this machine, I copied both of these modules from the VMF5 production preview from, uh, from last month. So that's a thing to be aware of if you're going to, to try this out. So the first thing we're going to do is to create a local folder for our git for our git repositories. I just like to store it in my profile in a folder called git. Uh, like I said, I'm using uh, internal repositories for both PowerShell git and uh, uh, and package management. There are some excellent guides over here. I'll include the references if you want to know how these were set up, but these are, these are previously set up in this uh, demo environment. You could, of course, get everything from PowerShell Git or the official repositories as well, but this is like a, a trust issue if you don't want to install things from the internet on your computer. You might want to verify or package it yourself on, on internal repositories. Uh, so here is the call for adding the root certificate. That's already been done, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, the package uh, source is also registered. I'm just going to do it once more because I think it's going to install the chocolatey provider. <coughs> this is like the first message you, you get when you regis register it for the first time because it's bootstrapping the, the provider for chocolatey. For those of you who haven't heard of chocolatey before, it's a... It's a repository on the internet for uh, which contains software all kinds of software for for uh, you to install via via package management which was formerly called OneGit if you maybe heard of it before and here it says that it was already registered because I have previously done it on this uh, computer uh, so here is also the next one installing git this I also did uh, previously because it took like a minute or something I didn't want to wait for it but here I'm installing it from the local repository so I know it's a uh, trusted software uh, so the next thing I'm going to do is basically download the git repository that I showed you here into the local git folder and here I need to launch a new run space because uh, git wasn't if you install it, it isn't added to the path until the next uh, time we launch PowerShell. That's why I run it in an external. I also installed Git credentials, so my credentials for the repository was injected, so you don't have to watch me type the password wrong ten times. <laughs> uh, 
then we're going to run the remaining uh, demos from the repository because now we got the whole repository down to the local computer so we can do everything from there. So I'm just going to launch a, a initialization script from the repository. So now we can just close the script I copied and run everything from the local uh, disk. I also <coughs> added uh, this on the top in case some of you are downloading it and accidentally hitting F5 then you will, will just run a little uh, too fast so I will just break out of it. I also tried to add regions so that it's a little bit more uh, easier to read. <coughs> so there are four scripts I'm going to show you here. Uh, the first one is uh, creating scheduled jobs for repetitive tasks. Uh, so at the top here we are creating credentials and storing them on the local disk so that the scheduled jobs can uh, run uh, using those credentials because a few of the jobs are leveraging credentials which I will get back to. I just chose to store it in uh, the local application data folder because this is encrypted using the DP API on each machine so I have to run this once for every machine. So here I'm just going to specify the username and the password. So there are four sample jobs I've uh, configured here. The first one is for uh, updating help. That's something you probably are forgetting to do on a regular basic basis and it's so easy to, to set up. I'm just going to update help for, for uh, uh, all modules. You could be more specific and just do the PowerShell uh, internal modules if you wanted, but I just run up that help like this. I also added a run now switch so that it will be run immediately. Uh, the next one is uh, update module, and that might be a little bit more controversial. Uh, that's more of a personal preference if you want to auto update modules unattendedly. Uh, you might just do this if you want everything to just happen automatically or you can do more limited auto-updating. For example, if you just Tobias, you can auto-update IC steroids or specify a comma and just uh, do some specific modules. Uh, here I also wanted to add some logging so that I can go back and see what have been updated. For example, send an email for each time a module is updated or add the logging to a file for example. So that's something I haven't uh, implemented yet. So all of these are going to run daily uh, during the night. Uh, the next one is uh, one for cleaning up folders. Uh, for example, personally I don't like to put stuff on the desktop so I just hide all icons from the from the desktop view but I also like to clean up all shortcuts that get installed there. This is from my personal profile on the kind of all users profile on uh, Windows 10. Uh, also the downloads folder, it uh, tends to be pretty cluttered over time. So I just uh, create a dollar underscore clean folder where I put stuff that is older than uh, two days and things from that folder again is removed after two days. But this is also kind of a personal preference. I also tend to create a temp directory <coughs> on the C drive and it's called temp for a reason so I'm deleting all the files older than 14 days from that folder. So this is just a simple cleanup job that I like to have uh, configured. Especially the downloads folder tends to be very, very cluttered after uh, a few weeks when you download things constantly and it's just a big mess, so having it uh, automatically cleaned up is, uh, is pretty useful. So let's just go ahead and create this job as well. Uh, the next one is about uh, creating uh, configuration documents for uh, Royal TS, if you heard about it. It's what I'm using in this presentation for uh, managing remote desktop connections. So I created uh, in version 3, they came out with a PowerShell module for managing a lot of things which I've written an article about. Uh, so basically you can uh, create the configuration documents that contains the computers you are connecting to automatically. So 
In here, I have created a script that will uh, uh, retrieve a real document path from my documents folder, and this is from a specific environment, the uh, demo environment at uh, my work. Uh, it will uh, run this script uh, called, uh, which is using the Royal TS module. And here you can specify, for example, what OU do you want to get computer accounts from. You can specify the root domain if you want everything, but here I want just a specific OU. Uh, then you can also specify credentials, because uh, this machine is not in the same domain as uh, as the environment I'm getting information from. Then it's also has some other parameters for, uh, for example, update folder properties and computer properties. It's a little bit easier if I show you a uh, document here. This is the second computer, which is fully configured, where I've installed Royal TS, and I've opened a document which is uh, generated by that scheduled job. So if you look down here, if I hover over the service folder, this is uh, the folder that was created by the scheduled job. And it contains all of the computers from that OU. So if you hover over it, you get a description field from AD. So that's also that's what the dash update folder, uh, update computer properties was for. So if you change the properties in AD, it will also be changed inside here. Uh, also, you can choose to remove um, old computer accounts. So for example, if a server is, is uh, de-promoted and removed and have not logged on to the domain for X number of days, it will be removed from your document as well. You also get uh, uh, the OU structure. For example, Hyper-V servers, which was on OU under the server's uh, OU. So that's dynamically generated, so you don't have to go in here and manually add servers you are wanting to to connect to. There is also a PowerShell support in here, so you can add PowerShell activities. When you right-click on a server, you can run a PowerShell commandlet, for example. So it's uh, worth checking out. If you're on MVP, you can also get an NFR license for it. Uh, so that was that scheduled job. So now we basically created four scheduled jobs for different uh, yeah, maintenance tasks, if you, if you will. Uh, the second part is about configuring the computer itself. Oh, I just uh, configured some jobs for repetitive tasks. The next uh, part is uh, about uh, configuring the computer. So we're going to look at two options. First one being a manual configuration, or semi-manual if you will, by using some scripting. And the second one is declarative, which is using uh, the side state configuration. The last thing we will look at is the PowerShell environment configuration, the profiles on the stuff I mentioned in the beginning. So if you look at this one, uh, this is um, yeah, configuring the basics, such as the computer name, uh, adding it to a domain if you want that. Personally, I don't have my computer's domain joined because at my work we're using Office 365, so I just get my email from there and uh, uh, all internal stuff I can uh, can reach through websites or VPN if I want to. We don't have a requirement to, to join to a domain, but if you want, you can of course do that using PowerShell. Also, like to create some uh, drive mappings. Uh, you can do that using UPS Drive. Uh, Mike Robbins, if you heard of him, is a PowerShell MVP as well. He's uh, written an article about removing. Uh, yeah packages from Windows 10 Enterprise because when you're at work you probably don't want all of these weather applications and stuff like that uh, on, your, on your work machine. So he's written a really good uh, article with some samples that I just copied from his article for removing some of this built-in stuff. Uh, next one is packages. Here we're leveraging uh, Chocolatey and uh, package management to install some packages. Um, I guess when you install, reinstall your computer, there are a list of things that you want to install uh, that you can define using, for example, uh, an array or get it from a CSV file or whatever, and uh, just uh, install it from, for example, an internal repository as I have configured here. 
or from the official chocolate day repository if you want to trust that. So here I'm basically just doing a for each and checking if it's installed. If not, we're going to install it from the internal package source. Same for modules. Uh, first re register the internal repository. If your company doesn't have one, I would recommend you to do it because it's just making it so much easier to just install modules you are sharing with your uh, internal colleagues. So here I'm just an example using two modules, uh, same concept. For each, I'm going to install the module if it's not uh, installed. Uh, then I also looked, about, uh, looked into tweaking settings specific to uh, the operating system, some of them are specific to Windows 10. And then I came uh, came about to see uh, Yap Brothers module. He's created a customized Windows 10 module, which is available on GitHub. So instead of reinventing the wheel, I, I got into talk with him and uh, leveraged his module and also added, this I've already added a few DSC resources for configuring uh, some options like uh, Explorer options for show hidden files and <coughs> and things like that, which is in his module. So here you can, for example, uh, retrieve and uh, configure the app theme in Windows, the OneDrive navigation pane in Explorer, uh, PowerShell Win X, which is this Windows X that you get PowerShell instead of command prompt there, and also Windows 10 specific features such as uh, Snap Assist. There is an enable and disable snap assist. Same with snap fill. And here is the set pinned application that I told you, which doesn't work anymore. Because for some reason, there are some verbs when you, when you right click on an icon. So you can pin it to the taskbar or the task menu, but those are taken away in the latest cumulative update. So I'm not sure if, if it's a bug or if they have uh, deliberately removed it so that we can't automate it but anyway it's a it's a bug that is posted on connect so hopefully it will be fixed uh, we also want to do things like we do in the registry we want to wrap this around the functions so it's more user friendly if you want to do it interactively but uh, i haven't had time to do it yet so here is just a uh, uh, commands to enable show hidden files and so on uh, using the registry. The same for configuring the power plan in Windows. You can do that using the namespace simv2 power and the class min32 power plan. So I created a DSC resource for this, but I haven't created any functions yet. So it's the goal to get feature parity in the module so that uh, all functions correspond to what is available in the DSC resource. That was the manual approach, uh, but uh, at least personally, I like to. I really like GSE. I worked with it for since it came out, and I find it a software exercise to also configure my local mm. computer using GSE. So that's the second option we're going to look at. So I have divided it into a few regions. First, we need to define some variables. There are some credentials in the configuration, so we need a Certificate, we're creating a self signed certificate. Then we're configuring the LCM or the DSC client, if you will. Then we define what modules and packages we want to install. And then we have the DSC configuration itself. So if we start by looking at the variables, just defining uh, what environment I'm in. Uh, and uh, setting some variables for where to store the mod files and uh, certificates and so on. Uh, next, I'm checking if we have a, a certificate we can use to to encrypt the credentials. And as we can see here, we have no certificate in there right now. So that's why we're just checking here if there is no certificate. I'm just going ahead and creating a self-signed certificate. I know there's a new self-signed certificate in PowerShell 4, I guess, but uh, I had some bad experiences with uh, using it in production for, I believe it was uh, configuring uh, certificates for DPM to Azure or something. It didn't work, but it worked when using the legacy tools. So that's why I 
I'm a little bit skeptical to that command letter until the. Uh, I, I think it was a bug in it. So we're just going ahead <coughs> and creating a certificate using the command line tool, certrack. Yeah, and I've run this demo before, so I just say yes to overwrite the existing file. Uh, then I check if it's uh, available. And then I also have to export it and import it into the trusted store. So that's what I'm basically doing here. So it's a trusted certificate. Uh, next up, I'm going to configure the local configuration manager. So here I'm, uh, I think uh, for production, we typically use 30 or 60 minutes for the uh, refresh frequency minutes. But uh, on a, my local computer, that's just too often. So I configure it to every six and every 12 hours. If not, it could have a performance impact if it's running too often. Uh, so th that's just a personal preference. I also chose uh, to use apply and autocorrect and uh, injecting the certificate thumbprint here for encrypting the credentials. <coughs> so let's just go ahead and define this. Create them off. Uh, as you might know, uh, in the client, uh, Potion remoting or WS man is not enabled by default. So here you can go ahead and either enable partial remoting, but uh, the minimum requir requirement for DSC is just to create a win RM listener. So that's also a personal preference what you want to do. I'm just going to do the minimal one. So checking that we have a listener. You must also check that your network profile is not set to public. So I'm just checking that there. Here you can see that it's private, so it's okay. If not, you could have used this to change it. Uh, this I don't think it's uh, necessary, but I also adding the local uh, computer name to trusted hosts. And then apply the configuration. Uh, I actually have more files for two computers in that part, so if I don't specify computer name, I will get an error. Let's just fix that. There we go. Now it's configured with the uh, settings. The thumb print I just created and uh, the frequency minutes. Uh, this is basically the same as you saw. Uh, yeah, first we have to install, since I'm using push, I'm not using uh, pull in this scenario. I must uh, pre stage the modules required for the DSC configuration. Mm -hmm. So here I'm using this uh, module uh, from Microsoft, I believe from uh, GitHub for configuring and registering uh, package management and uh, partial gallery uh, repositories. Also the X computer management to domain join or work group join. So I'm just going ahead and installing those. <coughs> those are installed from, yeah, and also this is the first time it's run, so it's bootstrapping the new get uh, binaries. I'm just say yes to that. It will take a, a few minutes to run. So here it will basically just check if uh, the module is not installed. It will uh, find it and install it. Uh, this one is actually <coughs> getting it from the gallery, but if you wanted, you could of course gotten it from the internal as well. So this will take a few seconds to complete. Um, Yeah, I also created a DSC resource for uh, package management for installing packages. I believe this was available earlier as uh, X1 get, but I can't find it anymore. So this is just a renamed version of that, which I created, which I have locally. Uh, I could upload it to the gallery or to GitHub, but I wanted to wait and see if Microsoft will uh, create a resource themselves and add it into this one which I think I heard some rumors about. Anyway, you can find this uh, module in the repository that you will uh, get access to afterwards. Uh, unable to find the version. Yes, this is an error I get uh, sometimes when I install it from uh, the gallery for some reason. Sometimes it works and sometimes it comes with this exception, but uh, that's not important for, for this demo. Anyway, uh, then I also have a uh, slightly more updated uh, version of uh, <coughs> the customized Windows 10 module 
locally. Uh, it contains one additional DSC resource which I haven't uploaded yet. So let's just go ahead and copy the latest one. So those were the modules which is required for the DSC configuration. The uh, next one is the modules that we want to install and have available locally, which was what we did in the manual approach. So here you can just choose to specify it like this, or you can get it from a CSV file or an Excel sheet or wherever you want to, to get it from. Uh, for testing purposes, I'm just taking uh, Lee Holmes await module. Uh, the same with packages. We need a list of packages. Here I'm just taking the 7 zip package. But on the other computer, I installed all of those that you can see here. Uh, this is an interesting one. Uh, when I tried to add the AppX packages to a DSC resource, I uh, went ahead and created a simple DSC resource for and installing AppX packages. But uh, there were some issues getting it to work. So if we uh, look down here, Uh, when uh, basically when uh, the when the Apex packages was uninstalled using DSC, the icons was not removed from the start menu. So even though that the package was actually uninstalled, it was not removed from the start menu. Uh, and I'm also <coughs> using PSDSC Renas credentials uh, in V5 in order to run it under my uh, computer uh, user account. But uh, it was uninstalled, as I said, but the icon was not removed. So I think it's something funky with uh, removing things from the start menu in uh, Windows 10. It's just, you can't just go into a folder and remove the icons like you did in previous version. I think this is some kind of database that doesn't work when it's uh, run under DSC. Because I believe maybe the profile, the user profile, must be loaded in order for it to work. I'm not sure, but... Uh, it didn't work, so that's why I have not published a DSC resource for the Apex packages. So that's best to just run, the ma run it manually until you figure out what's the problem. So this is underlined because it uh, can load the Windows 10 module. So we just do this little trick of uh, take a space there and go back, then it will uh, rediscover what modules you have installed. But since it failed to download this module from the gallery it uh, still brackets there but that that's not important for this demo i'm just uh, going to show it i'm not going to, to run it so here i'm uh, defining the settings from con from a psd1 hash table which i will show you further down so here is uh, the work group this one is drawn to a work group uh, here is some settings from the DSC resource that I created, a composite resource for setting all those uh, register keys. For example, connected standby, I got some bad experiences with during the preview of Windows 10, so I chose to disable it. The same with uh, enabling driver installations from Windows Update, which you can't choose, pick and choose updates in Windows 10, everything just gets installed. So this one will just disable Windows Update uh, of drivers. And this is basically the settings that I showed you earlier on to configure different settings. And I also configured the Windows Update mode to notify instead of just automatically install and reboot. Uh, and here you can see that I'm uh, running it uh, as uh, I'm specifying credentials so that it's all the register keys is changed under edge key current user for my user account. That's something that uh, you couldn't do previously. Uh, same with the power plan. I created a power plan DSC resource inside the customized Windows 10 module for setting uh, the power plan to balance. And this is just a few properties that I personally like to configure. There are probably a lot of other settings that you might want to adjust, but uh, they, uh, they should be added uh, in there as well. But I didn't have time to more than these that I wanted to configure. Uh, next one is the packages, uh, the AppX packages, which unfortunately not working as uh, expected, but I, I created it like this, that you just specify the package name you want to remove, and it runs it under your user credentials. So, uh, then you have the package management source. 
So you can use it to register your internal package repository. Uh, same for modules, PS module or internal gallery for that. And uh, this is just going ahead and installing all the modules that you specified earlier on. Uh, same with packages. It's installing, it's a for each loop that will install all packages, which is in configuration data that I will uh, show you right here. So this is the configuration data. So here you have uh, yeah, all of the nodes uh, defined. I also have um, things like uh, the URIs for the internal uh, uh, repositories in non-node data. And I have the user credentials in uh, the node data. The packages which we defined, which could be from a CSV file or whatever. The Apex packages and the modules. So everything is inside this uh, configuration data. Uh, yeah, let's just go ahead and define that. And I will be prompted for the password. So you can just yeah, inspect. And I also, I like personally like to verify that uh, to keep a history of what I've configured. So I'm just exporting the config data to JSON. And since I didn't uh, uh, define the configuration, I'm not going to run it now. But obviously, you just define it and run it. And it will take a few minutes because it's installing quite a bit of software on uh, modules and so on. So now we're going to jump over to the other computer, which is uh, fully configured. Uh, that was the declarative configuration part. The last thing I'm going to show you today is uh, the environment configuration. So now we set up some scheduled jobs. We configured the computer and installed software, either manually or declarative. And the last thing I'm going to do is to configure the local conf uh, PowerShell environment, like the profiles and, and stuff. So let's jump into this script. Uh, here we can go ahead and use, uh, yeah, I like to use uh, the show tree command from, uh, from, uh, the PSTX module for this. Let me just copy the path. Because if you use the tree command inside of ISE, there is some funky things going on with the encoding, I think. So let's just use this one. So here is the folder structure uh, in the in the Windows PowerShell folder. So this is the Git folder we cloned. This is the name of the repository. And this is the Windows PowerShell folder. So in the here. I have this structure where I created an environments folder. Uh, there I have some artifacts which is applied to all environments. This is my work <coughs> environment. I have a number of customer specific things. The demo, this is the demo environment that we are sitting in right now. Where we have some artifacts specific for, for example, DSC and operations and so on. Then we have modules and uh, scripts. This is just a, I took a copy of my, my personal repository and removed most of the old stuff and just created this to show the, the structure I use. So that's the structure. Let's go ahead and have a look at uh, the profiles. Uh, at the top I added this uh, simple uh, if logic so that you can just hold control down if you don't want the module to be loaded because it can take a few seconds to load when you have a lot of stuff in your profile and if you just want to do something quick and dirty you might want to skip it just press uh, the control down uh, then we have uh, for example defining variables from uh, the an all folder so this is going to be defined for all environments same with functions I've not using this so much anymore. I'm moved most of the stuff to modules, but if you want to define some functions, you can do it here. Uh, same with modules. There are a few modules that I want to explicitly <coughs> load and not rely on uh, auto loading. Uh, my core tools, which is a module with a bunch of tools I've either created myself or found useful from the internet. And you probably know tab expansion, PS read line from from Jason on uh, format PX from uh, Kirkman Row. 
Then we're mapping some uh, PS drives. I like to have this script PS drive where I can just go into all of the root root script folder. And then I have some environment specific setup. So it's checking, the first one is checking on the user domain. So if I'm in the Crayon domain, if I'm in the customer domain or in the demo environment, it will set up some environment specific things. For example, here it will run this setup of PS1 file and do some specific things for that environment that we will look at in a minute. Uh, I also mentioned that some of my computers are not domain joined, so for those I'm just using uh, a switch, checking for the computer name, in this case demo PC, which is these two that I used for the demo, <coughs> and do some specific things on those. Uh, then I just, uh, at the end, print out some information when the profile loads. For example, test if I have internet access, uh, provide some uh, uh, killing some puppies, I guess, <laughs> and uh, showing the PowerShell version, PS drives. By the way, right host is not killing puppies in V5, is it? Because of the new information scheme. So I guess I'm uh, covered there. Uh, then I'm going to show uh, what PS drives are loaded and uh, get a quote of the day just for fun from the internet. Yeah, defining some aliases. This is also stuff that is done in the environment specific things, but here it's being done for all environments. Uh, setting the location and customizing the prompt. Uh, that was the profile.ps1, which is applied to all hosts. Then I also have some modifications to the host specific ones. This one I just uh, removed everything, I think, because it wasn't so many useful things to show. But in the ISE, you can see, uh, for example, here, if the computer is one of those three, which I have a ISE steroids license on, it will import that module. And if it's PowerShell version 2, I want to change the colors to be the same as in the version 3 or 4 on 5. Uh, yeah, <coughs> so let's just have a look at uh, the settings inside the, what gets applied to all environments. Uh, so for example, for variables, I, I think I learned this from Don John's uh, once, that I, for not having red error text, I like to have it white so nobody can see that I'm doing anything wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for the Active Directory module, I like to not load the default drive, so I just configure it to zero. And I also initialize a few default parameters, for example, for, yeah, you can see it yourself here. And also some specific things based on what version it is. And I also tend to use kind of this uh, uh, cheat sheet variables for things I never can uh, remember. For some reason, I'm unable to remember the syntax for the V3 uh, argument passing. Uh, the direct access net shell commandlet, which was used before Windows 8. You're no, never going to remember this. So I just create kind of cheat sheet variables. Uh, that was the variables. I'm just going to skip this one because there are a few things I want to show before we run out of time. <coughs> Uh, lastly, uh, yeah, I'll have a look, quick look at an environment specific uh, setup file here. So here I'm adding uh, things, for example, to the ISE uh, for the demo environment. I want to add uh, uh, things to this uh, menu up here for shortcuts, basically, to script for, for example, Active Directory operations, Cisco UCS operations. Uh, this is also kind of cheat sheets for connecting to servers and stuff like that. And also this one, which I'll show you in a second. Here you can also do environment-specific mapping or define environment-specific variables. For example, get a list of all clusters in the environment and store it in variables, stuff like that. There are a lot of things you can do. So the last thing I'm going to to do is uh, to create a symbolic link for the PowerShell folder <coughs> because now it's inside my profile and uh, the Git folder. So I'm just going to create a symbolic link so that it will uh, show up in uh, documents on Windows PowerShell. As you know, the PowerShell is looking here for uh, profiles and <coughs> modules. So here I'm just 
creating basically kind of a shortcut to the actual folder. So when I do that, you can see that it has this little arrow here indicating that it's a symbolic link or shortcut. So now when I launch PowerShell, the, the profiles will get loaded. So let's go ahead and start PowerShell.exe. Here you can see that it will print out all the info and stuff like that. What version I'm running, what host, PS drives, the modules, if I have internet access and so on. Uh, but I want to show it in the ISE, so let's just close this one and reopen it. So now it will basically load the profiles and add in the top here uh, a few shortcuts to, to the scripts I showed you. So if you go here, you can see this uh, daily local computer that I showed you. So here is things that uh, basically do every day uh, on the local computer. <coughs> this is just a sample of some of it. Uh, first off is uh, credentials. I'm storing it the uh, same way as I uh, showed you earlier here in the application data folder. There are probably some uh, suggestions how I can do this better. So I've made a note of things to check out for handling it better. But for now, I'm just storing it in this uh, XML file, which is encrypted using the DP API. Let's go ahead and initialize those uh, and import the XML files. Yeah, and uh, just for fun, uh, before we uh, wrap up the session, um, in May I got uh, my first child, my first child, a little boy. So I'll just uh, uh, initialize this one. Uh, and my wife and I, we are using this application on our phones to log everything that we do when he's sleeping, when he's getting food, everything. So the application. Is the baby instrumented or you have to add into I that? Too? I have to uh, do it manually. <laughs> but uh, um, the website has some uh, statistics from the phones that we can get. So I created this get baby stats uh, function for retrieving information from that. So just uh, go ahead and uh, retrieve that, and you can. Uh, so now we will get updated data from the last minutes, I guess, when he was uh, getting a new diaper or whatever. <laughs> so if you look at the data, you can see that he was uh, he's sleeping now actually, and uh, here you can do <laughs> and here you can do all kinds of things you can do in PowerShell, like slicing with the data, so you can view sleep data. When did this uh, to see patterns and just yeah, this is just for fun basically. Uh, and other activities you can group. If you group it, you can see what is doing most: sleeping, nursing, yeah, typing, and so on. So yeah, there are also some other stuff in here that I don't have time to show you. So I'm just going to wrap up. Uh, I think I have two minutes left. <coughs> there are some more options here, I know I just show you a starting point, but uh, for example, uh, Jay Wyatt, he created this policy file editor module, which basically lets you get any settings from group policy editor, which you're probably familiar with, and uh, use that in a desired state configuration <coughs> to configure any uh, user setting, so that's worth checking out. Uh, you might also have heard of this program called uh, Ninite, or how it's pronounced, for installing software. So you can ch just go into this website and check what software you want to install and get this installer, which will uh, install all, all of those programs. And it can also uh, say no to all the toolbars, uh, handle all the updating and, uh, and uh, so on. So that's, uh, but uh, those features are only available in the Pro Edition, so it's not free. Other options that are discussed, uh, Box Starter, uh, Vagrant, and so on, but it's mostly targeting developers, so this might also suit your needs, but uh, we're PowerShell people, right? <coughs> so the discussion points, we have to take it afterwards, because uh, Don is uh, watching at me right now. <laughs> so uh, the, the demos and slides is uh, out on Twitter, if the Twitter scheduling gods are with us. Uh, so just uh, here you can also find the repository of all the code I just uh, showed you. And my contact information.
I'll, uh, yeah, you can just look me up on Twitter at uh, Jan Egelring, uh, there you'll find all the links and so on. So, thank you very much.